So th this tutorial right now is a kind of overview of statistics. Um, the purpose is because I, I assume most people have taken a class in statistics or are familiar with statistics, kind of all scientists. So th the point here is that I think even when we do take classes in statistics, there can be a bunch of concepts that are a little tricky or murky. So the point is to kind of just go over some concepts and kind of keep this interactive and fun. And so if you have any questions about anything that's ever come up with statistics, you can ask and we'll go over some basics. Um, and then tomorrow I'm giving another tutorial that uh, is listed as neural data analysis, but it's really more about uh, a bunch of results about how information is kind of uh, transformed as it goes through the brain to allow us to do behaviors. And I'll, there I'll also talk about data analysis as well and how you can apply some of the methods that I use in my research. But it's more uh, kind of results research focused while this is more tutorial, uh, you know, uh, hopefully something useful for you to learn. So uh, again, please feel free to interrupt throughout uh, and try to keep it interactive. Um, so as a little bit of motivation, I'm going to just play a video from 538. Um, it's basically describing how uh, the concept of a p-value is often murky in the head of scientists and even people who analyze data. So hopefully the volume works. Everyone here. What is a p-value? What's a p-value? What is a p-value? What is a p-value? A p-value. Oh. What is a p-value? <laughs> I'm going to pass on that. So, wow, the p-value is um, the hypothesis you're testing uh, is um, uh, you need statistics to try to estimate if what you think is there. Um, I know what many people that uh, I have respected have written about and in fact quoted them. Is that a roundabout enough way to dodge your question? Can you explain what a p-value is in a sentence? <laughs> well, I've actually spent my entire career about the definition of p-values, but I cannot tell you what it means and almost nobody can. Okay, so just to say uh, that even these basic concepts that we hopefully have some familiarity with are, are, can be tricky and subtle. So how many people here think they could explain what a p-value is? <laughs> okay, a couple people. So okay, this seems like this talk might be worth going through. Um, all right, and they're going to be following up on Chris's uh, picture taking. There's going to be some bad jokes to hopefully Keep it entertaining. Okay, so like I said, statistical concepts can be a little tricky, uh, and I thought it'd be useful to go over things. And please ask questions if anything comes up that you know you're confusing or you don't know why I've put things on slides or whatnot. Okay, uh, so an overview. I'm just going to talk about descriptive statistics and uh, then inferential statistics. Uh, if there's interest in time at the end, I can, you know, maybe we'll take a little bit of a break, but for those of you who analyze neural data, like spiking activity, I could also go through specific methods that are used more by those communities, like mutual information, or, so, uh, again, depending on time and interest, uh, otherwise, I'm sure no one's going to object to getting out a little early if we hopefully can do that, too. Um, okay. All right. So, I guess, to keep it interactive, uh, so where does data come from? Which data? Right. Good question. Um, so I, I just put storks, right? So they, they deliver your data. Um, but, but, but really, uh, when we're thinking about it, like conceptually, uh, the way statisticians frame it is from things called distributions, uh, which uh, you all took the probability tutorial the other day. And so these are often described mathematically. And it's basically, uh, if there was, if we had infinite amounts of data, we would have access to the full distribution. Um, or maybe there's some sort of process that generates data, and if we could somehow know and see the truth of this process, we would have access to this full distribution. So the distribution is kind of the truth. So we could uh, put a picture of Plato up there and say, the truth relies in the distribution, right? Um, but in reality, we don't have access to that. We don't have infinite amounts of data. Uh, so we just have um, truth 
we just have the shadows, okay? So it's like Plato's cave, we can't see reality, we only can approximate reality uh, through our data, okay? And so a big point, particularly the point of statistical inference, is to be able to try to say something about the truth and this underlying process that generates data from only these vague uh, samples of data that we have, okay? That's kind of the name of the game. So again, how do we get data? Um, well, it's a little rhetorical. We, we do the science, right? So, uh, you know, you have labs and collect it in many different ways. Um, and if we're collecting data, um, often what we want to do is we want to collect it uh, using uh, simple random sampling. So if we're uh, recording, uh, let's say, from a particular brain region that we have, that we think has one function, and we're recording from neurons, we want to sample them uh, kind of randomly, right? Each neuron has equally likely probability of being selected. Um, so that's called random selection. And okay, so this is a real question. Uh, why would we want to do random selection? To avoid sampling error. Avoid sampling error. Uh, right, so there's a related concept. Yeah. To avoid bias Right, to avoid, to avoid bias. So sampling error is just the random fact that if you have different samples, you end up with different statistics. It's called sampling error. Um, and bias is being systematically off. Okay, and so uh, sampling error is um, kind of unavoidable, but, uh, but I think you're getting at the same concept. But it's the, the concept's actually called bias when you're systematically off, right? And so um, if, you, if you do simple uh, random selection, uh, you'll be able to uh, take your sample and then say something about that underlying process. You'll be able to generalize, right? And again, that's the name of the game, to say something about the underlying process. Um, and so the way to think about it is uh, the soup analogy. Um, if you have a bowl, uh, have a pot of soup, uh, you can tell whether, let's say, the whole pot needs more salt just by taking a simple spoonful of it. Um, and the reason that works is because your spoonful has, you know, millions of molecules or thousands of molecules on it, and that's a pretty... Uh, although it's a small sample, it's very representative of the whole pot. And so by just using a small amount of data, you can generalize to the full pot because it's been randomly selected. Right. Um, obviously, if you have sampling bias and you just get a potato, then that's not going to generalize unless it's a potato soup. Right? Uh, so uh, that's why we want to have a good sample. Okay. So uh, here's some data. This is uh, data about flights and how long they were delayed, so nothing to do with neuroscience, but any data set you get often uh, has this format where you have uh, what are called cases here. Uh, these are the individual uh, items that were recorded and collected, and then you have uh, the rows in are called variables. Uh, that's a statistical term, not to be confused with uh, variables, let's say, in computer science. Um, and then there are different types of variables. So you can have variables that are categorical. Those fall into uh, discrete groups. Um, and you can also have quantitative data, which is data you can do math on. Right? You can't do math on categories. Um, OK. So if you're analyzing your data, uh, what's kind of a good first thing to do? To look at the distribution, right? So usually a good first step, yeah. Uh, I, I, would, I would even say cleaning it, but I guess you uh, think Right, so cleaning, yeah. So that would probably be even a good first thing to do as well, make sure. But a kind of one way to tell if you need to clean it is to visualize it or plot it as well. So if you see some big problems, uh, you know, if you don't plot it first or look at it, then you don't just want to jump into the inferential statistics. All right, so what's a good way to plot if we have uh, categorical data? Bar plots, right? So bar plots are, all you do is you count how many items are each in each category, and you just plot the total, right? Or you can normalize and plot the proportion. So if you have categorical data, you kind of go with the bar plot. Uh, if you have uh, quantitative data, uh, what are some ways to plot that? Scatter plot if you have two variables and you want to look at the relationship, um, or a time series maybe. Uh, other ways? Yep. The histogram. Yeah, that's a good one. That's kind of, I would say that's the go-to. 
uh, because when you're looking at the histogram, this gives you kind of the shape of, or a, again, a shadow of the underlying distribution, right? And so you can kind of see this is uh, a bimodal uh, distribution and get some kind of uh, intuitive understanding, again, before you jump into more advanced analyses. OK. Uh, there are other types of plots you might see for quantitative data. Um, this is a uh, box plot. Do people know how to read a box plot? Yes? Too basic? Does everyone know what this is? Median? This? Third quartile, right? So this is 75% of your data is less than this value. Uh, this is the, the first quartile, so 25% of your data is less than this value. Uh, what about these guys? Uh, yeah, so these are, these are the extreme values, the maximum and the minimum, um, that don't include outliers, OK? Um, does, does anyone know what this, the length of the box is called? It's, yeah, it's called the interquartile range. Um, so this is the middle 50% of your data, right? And so outliers often in these box plots are usually plotted with little you know, circles or Xs above the maximum min. And there are any point that is 1.5 times the interquartile range. So if you take this one up and went 1.5, if there was some point that far out, then you wouldn't plot that point as your maximum or minimum. You just put a little dot. OK. So again, hopefully a lot of people have been exposed to this. But if you've forgotten what that is, now you can read those. I remember uh, this data comes from a hot dog eating contest. These are all the, the contest winners. Um, so. This, what this is not showing you is the time progression, because the people who are eating 70 are in the later years. They got better as they kept on going. But, all right, and there are other ways to plot it. So um, you can plot kind of something similar. These, does anyone know what those are called? Oops, I have the title, violin. Violin plots, right? And so this is like a kind of a smoother version of it. So here, this is uh, more of like a histogram that's been smoothed and mirrored. OK, and it kind of gives you the same thing. Um, obviously, a bit more detail there, but these can still be useful if you just want to look at these key statistics. Okay, uh, and you know, people are still inventing or reinventing new ways to analyze data. So there was something called a joy plot that was all the rage a couple years ago. Um, I guess you guys don't follow the latest in statistical plots, but uh, a lot of people find violin plots to be kind of ugly. So. I don't know. Those are not the most beautiful looking thing. Any guesses why that's, why they find them ugly? They look like Christmas ornaments or other things. Um, so the joy plot looks much better. This is a joy plot. And so if you're comparing a bunch of items, uh, you've just plotted a little smoothed uh, kind of density function, kind of the smooth histogram for your different categories. And it's easy to compare. It looks nice. And anyone know why this is called a joy plot? You know? Right, so it looks like the cover of the Joy Division album. Yeah. I say, I say. So I should put the, we should call this the physics plot or whatever it is. I say, I say. Good, that's good to know. See, this is why I'm doing this, so I can learn as well, improve, improve my talks. All right. Okay. And again, there's other types of plots. So there are dynamite plots. Ever, everyone's had seen these before, used these. I've used them. Maybe I shouldn't. This is from my paper. Uh, so a dynamite plot, like maybe you're a plot the mean and a standard error as like these dark bars. And uh, you know, turns out many statistics really, statisticians really hate these plots. Um, any intuition why? Not for aesthetic reasons. It's because uh, you're s wasting a lot of ink to give the reader very little information, right? So all you're plotting is the mean and a standard error. You got all this black bar here obscuring things. So you could just put a dot and a, error, a standard error that might be better. But you could even do a box plot or point, put, plot all your data. Nowadays, it's very easy to do things like that. So um, you know, might be recommended not to do this. Don't do don't do what I did, right? And then. You know, we can put up another joke here. Uh, all right, can't trust that guy. Okay. Okay, let's go on. 
Uh, so what is a statistic? Can anyone tell me what a, a statistic is? Yep. Exactly, right. So a statistic is any function of, your, of a sample of data, right? So you have data, you apply some mathematical function to it, it gives you a number, that's a statistic, right? Um, so an example would be like the sample mean. Uh, I, su I assume everyone knows how to calculate a sample mean. Right. Does everyone know the symbol that's typically used for the sample mean? I see some drawings. So x bar, right? So typically, if you're going to report in your paper that you've done a sample mean, it'd be good to use that symbol because that's just what is kind of commonly used. Right? Um, so again, if we have a distribution here, this says heights and in inches. I've got no idea. Oh, this is the heights of people on OkCupid. Um, and then you know, the middle of it is the, the, the sample mean, x bar, right? OK. And so a statistic, again, is a function of your sample. If you want uh, some property of your full distribution, uh, that's called a, um, does anyone know? It's called a parameter, right? Um, so if you have the full smooth thing, uh, so for example, the population mean, I gave it away, it's denoted mu, right? And so if we had all the data, we could get at this guy. And we notice this is in Greek, this is the truth, this is what we want. Uh, unfortunately, we're stuck with that one, right? Okay. Um, let's look at one more example statistic because I tried to throw a few things in here. So I, I assume, again, people are kind of... Um, familiar with the correlation coefficient, right? It's usually denoted R because it's a statistic of a sample of data. Um, and it's just some function of your data. So your data points are the xi. First you compute the mean, you compute the standard deviation of both two variables, and then you get some number out from all this data you collected, right? It's a statistic. And you know, it tells you something about your data. So it summarizes the sample of data you have and basically tells you uh, how close the points are to a line that would go through your data. And again here, this statistic R is an estimate of rho, and rho would be if you had infinite amounts of data and can actually compute the real, uh, the real value for that relationship. Okay. And again, just because I mentioned correlation, um, I have to say that correlation obviously is not causation. And the reason I have to say it is because I get to put a couple of jokes up, right? So has everyone seen this before? This is part of my favorite statistical joke. It says, I used to think correlation implied causation. Then I took a statistics class. Now I don't know. And she's like, sounds like that class helped. Well, maybe. Right. I have other jokes, too, about that. <laughs> All right, let's keep going. Someone sent me another anonymous email with a link to an article about the, uh, the world's worst bosses. I get one of those emails every time I leave your cubicle. Do you think I wouldn't notice the correlation? And then that guy's in the background. Correlation does not imply causation. Okay. All right, I promised there'd be bad jokes. I hope I'm delivering. Okay. Okay, so like I said, statistics, these functions of your sample of data, are usually denoted with uh, Latin or Roman characters. Um, so, uh, you know, for a single quantitative variable, we have the mean, which is x bar. Uh, for a single categorical variable, we have the proportion that's in each category. Does anyone know what symbol we use for that typically? No. So it's usually p hat. OK. And then we talked about for a pair of quantitative variables, we have the correlation coefficient r. Uh, and that's, you know, that's the symbol we use. And again, People don't always use these symbols, but I like the, the dichotomy between the Roman and the, the Greek to know whether you're talking about parameters or statistics. Right? So for each of these, again, like I said, there's the corresponding parameter that it could be an estimate of. Um, so if we have the parameters, we can note for the mean, we note mu. For the uh, single categorical variable of proportion, guesses? Pi, right? Some people use p, but that violates the principle of keeping them Greek, so I use pi. Uh, and then we have, for correlation, we have rho, as we talked about, right? Okay, and so then again, like I said, the name of the game with statistical inference is 
Um, we use the sample statistics to make judgments about the population parameters. So x bar is a uh, estimate of mu. Right. Okay. And again, to belabor the point, there's Plato with his Greek symbols, and there's our shadows, right? Okay. Um, and so when we, like I said, when we have a single statistic that's an estimate of a parameter, it's called a point estimate. Um, uh, and I think I was going to show something else, but I stuck in the regression slides here. So uh, one more example of a statistic. Um, so Related to correlation is the notion of regression. I just wanted to briefly talk about it. I wasn't sure to where to throw it in. So regression is just another, uh, it's a way to make predictions from one variable to another, right? So um, what I can do is I can predict based on the amount of ice cream sales I have, whether uh, the probability or the number of shark attacks that are gonna occur in a, a given year, right? So if a lot of ice cream was sold, I can use this line and I can say this year we sold 140 tons of ice cream and there were 45 shark attacks, right? And uh, these, you know, have uh, often as a linear equation, so the truth, the true relationship, there would be these uh, beta weights, which, again, if we had all the data, we could estimate those perfectly, and in reality, we just have a finite amount of data, and so we estimate uh, the Bs, B0 and B1, right? And again, approximations for those. So even regression is that same principle of they're statistics estimating parameters, right? Um, and to get the, the Bs, what we usually do is we just minimize the, the least uh, squares estimate of uh, your prediction and the actual data. Predictions, again, with this notation, are usually denoted with hats, or estimates are usually denoted with hats if you're not using Roman characters. So, uh, okay. Any questions about anything I've said so far? Okay, and just remember, if you're uh, doing regression, uh, don't try to make predictions way outside of the range that you fit your model on, right? So um, this is uh, someone extrapolating number of husbands as a function of the date. Yesterday she had zero, today she has one. If you keep on extrapolating, she will have many, many husbands very shortly. So be careful with that. Okay. All right, so uh, not only does data have distributions, but if you take data and compute a statistic from it and you repeat that process many times, you can have a distribution of statistics. Does that make sense? Okay, and so the distribution of statistics is called a sampling distribution. Um, and so, for example, again, uh, if I had one sample and I took that and computed the mean for that first sample, and then I had another sample and computed the mean again, and I did that many, many times, then I would have um, a distribution of statistics, right, from repeating the same. Now, obviously, we probably wouldn't want to do that in an experimental setting, because you'd have to repeat your study many, many times. Um, but theoretically, it's an important concept that every statistic you get comes from a distribution of statistics. Okay, so we can, and often these distributions are uh, normal. So you guys, I assume, went over the normal distribution. We needed probability. It's one of the most common ones. So if you're computing, uh, for example, means um, under just uh, very mild assumptions, um, often your statistics will have a normal distribution. Uh, okay, and that's due to the, the central limit theorem, which is a theorem you can prove showing that a lot of statistics have this property. Okay. So a point for, apart from a point estimate, which is, again, your best guess at the parameter, you can have an interval estimate. Okay, so an interval estimate is your point estimate plus some margin of error, right? So I think the true value is within this range. Um, so again, if that was our statistic, and that's our parameter, we're going to maybe not be able to say that our statistic perfectly reflects it, but we'll be able to say the true parameter is somewhere in this range. Okay. And so what a confidence interval is, if people know what a confidence interval is, you've used them. Okay. It's this method where you create these intervals that have the parameter in them most of the time. Sometimes they miss, but most of the time the parameter is in it. Right, so um, 
for example, you might want to say 95% of the time I create an interval, it's going to have the parameter in it. Um, so I think of this as in terms of kind of ring toss. Anyone know this game? So there's like a stick and you have to throw a ring on it and it's, uh, the ring's got to land on the stick, you know. Um, so basically, confidence intervals are you're constantly throwing these rings and 95% of the time you get the parameter in that interval and some of them miss, right? But it's just a small percentage. Downside is you don't know which one's missed and which one's hit, right? So for any one experiment you don't know, but you have what are called frequentist guarantees if the math all works out and everything's done correctly that you will be hitting 95% of them, okay? Um, all right, and I have this great game I play with the undergraduates where I have everyone estimate intervals for things. So I'll say like, how many floors does the Leaning Tower of Pisa have? And then you, you know, the students say somewhere between, you know, 10 and 70. And I ask them 10 of these types of questions, and they have to get nine of them right, right? And so that's kind of the notion of a confidence interval, right? Unfortunately, I don't have the cards with me today, so this is no fun. Right. Okay. Oh, here's the, the perfect illustration of it, right? So those are all intervals. The red ones missed to capture that parameter, which is the black vertical line. But most of them hit. Um, and obviously, there's a trade-off between the size you make your confidence interval and the proportion of times you hit, right? So if you made really large intervals, you'd always get the parameter, but it would be pretty useless, right? So for example, we can turn to Garfield. Uh, this is a 100% confidence interval. Taking a look at tomorrow's weather, the high temperature will be between 40 below zero and 200 above. And then Garfield's like, this guy's never wrong. Right? So that is a very large interval, which is essentially meaningless for whether you should wear shorts or not. But it is, uh, has 100% coverage. It's going to always hit the true temperature. Okay. Does this make sense to everyone? Am I going too fast, too slow? Is this useful? OK, feel free to ask questions, or if you're, I don't know, give me some indication that you're bored. I'll speed up. Go to the neural stuff. OK. OK, so how can we estimate these confidence intervals? There's a number of different ways, uh, some using mathematics, some using computation. So one way to do it is a method called the bootstrap. People familiar with the bootstrap? Some. OK, well, so the bootstrap is basically this idea um, what you do is essentially you're trying to create a estimate of the sampling distribution, your distribution of statistics, right? And so to do that, what you do is you take your original sample, maybe this figure will help, take the original sample and you sample with replacement from it. And so that sample with replacement is kind of a proxy for it as if you had gotten another sample from the population, right? And so you take that other sample, you compute your statistic on it, and that's called um, a bootstrap statistic. So the, the, the sample here is a bootstrap, or a bootstrap replicate. It's a, uh, uh, your statistic computed again from uh, a sample that was sampled with replacement from your original sample. Right? And you repeat that process many, many times, and you get a full distribution of statistics um, that are supposed to kind of mimic as if you had those sampling distribution statistics, if, if you had redone your study many, many times. And then from that, you can estimate um, what's called the standard error, and that's the standard deviation of your sampling distribution. OK, and so let's see. Maybe this picture will help. Um, OK, so suppose this is, um, I guess we can even say, suppose this was even the real sampling distribution. OK. Um, if, you know, and a lot of times the sampling distribution, as I mentioned, is going to be normal. Um, and so um, what that means is that for a normal distribution, 95% of your data lies within two standard deviations, right? Did you guys learn that yesterday? Or refreshed, you probably already know it. Um, okay, so if 95% of your data is within two standard deviations of the population mean, or 95% of your statistics, that means that if you take a given statistic, and you go back two standard deviations this way, or two standard errors and two standard errors out that way, you're going to hit, you're going to capture the population parameter like 95% of the time, because 95% of your points swing both ways will capture that parameter. Does that make sense? 
So that's why if this distribution is normal, um, you can use the two times your standard error to create a confidence interval that will capture the population parameter 95% of the time. Yeah? Oftentimes distributions are not normal. What are some ways that the or Right. So um, a lot of times your data is not normally distributed, but your statistics still will be. But there are cases where your statistics aren't even perfectly normal, a lot of cases. Um, and so first of all, if you've done this bootstrap procedure, it's a good idea to plot it just to take a look at it and see if it's, it seems normal. So sometimes we get just pathological cases and you can tell right away. Sometimes it even will look normal when the real sampling distribution wasn't and then maybe you're screwed or I don't know. <laughs> um, but uh, um, there are other methods. Um, so you can generate this bootstrap distribution and you don't need to, to calculate. So you calculate the standard error from this if this was actually bootstrap, not the sampling distribution by just calculating the standard deviation of your bootstrap replicates, right? And so, um, you know, you can kind of, this is just a proxy. Um, so what you can do though is from this distribution of uh, bootstraps replicates, um, you can take the, uh, the 2.5 and the 95th percentiles, right? And so within that, again, uh, that should capture the parameter 95% of the times, even if it's not perfectly normal or symmetric, um, you know? It doesn't always work, uh, so there's a lot of things. <laughs> people hide behind the perfect math and then reality. So, you know, a lot of people actually nowadays have been doing like simulations of things that finally be able to test all the theory you know, since the computational power is so cheap now compared to when they had to do it by hand. And, you know, it turns out uh, all the assumptions people have always been making are not perfectly true, but it generally works. Okay. Right, so again, calculating uh, confidence intervals, uh, you can, right, you can also use just mathematics. So based on, again, certain underlying assumptions that this is normal, um, the standard error will be given by this formula where S is your standard deviation, uh, N is your sample size. And so that gives you the standard error. And then uh, that's obviously much quicker than doing the, the bootstrap. Uh, and then you just do two times that plus or minus and that will capture the parameter again, 95% of the time. Yes. So uh, if you looked at the normal distribution and you want to capture the, mid, the middle 95%, um, it's actually at, um, if it was a standard normal, so zero mean standard deviation of one, 95% uh, is actually 1.98 out. Right, it's not actually two, but we just round up to two. It's a little, so you're being a little conservative. You're making your interval a little larger by using two and you could get away with, actually it's usually 1.96, right? Um, if you actually looked at the normal distribution, right? So if you want to be really precise, but it's all a little hand wavy anyway. <laughs> okay, any other questions? Understand what confidence intervals are? All right, okay. This is, there's a mistake in my title. So I was gonna ask, what is a p-value? It says, why is a p-value? <laughs> why p-value? That's another good question. Okay. And I guess I asked that question earlier and no one, not many people were willing to give it a shot. Is anyone feeling brave? Exactly right. So that, that's, um, that's exactly right. That's a technical definition. Um, now, I, in all fairness to that video, um, I think they didn't ask them just describe it that way because I think a lot of people maybe could do that, but they were trying to say, explain it to me. <laughs> and so um, uh, hopefully you also understand the, the, the concept, but, th but that part can be tricky as well. But that, that's, yeah, exactly right. Okay. Do you want to try that too? or? Okay. Um, maybe I'll give a shot at it because I, I, I use like 10 slides and maybe that might be helpful, but I, I'll, I'll give it a shot. But, um, so, so, right. So, um, sorry, what, what's your name? Victoria. Victoria. Okay. Right. So what Victoria said was basically you assume a null distribution. You assume nothing interesting is happening. 
and then you get your observed statistic from your sample of data, and you say, if these are the statistics I would get if nothing interesting was happening, what is the probability I would get my statistic, or a statistic this large or larger from this null distribution? Right. Um, OK. And so here we put in hypothesis tests in two steps. The next slide I'm going to do it in five. But basically, uh, what we do here is um, we create a null distribution. This is a distribution consistent with nothing interesting happening. OK, and then we see uh, where does our statistic lie in that distribution. If our statistic looks like a bunch of really boring statistics, then we probably haven't found anything interesting. But if our statistic looks very different than a whole bunch of boring statistics, then we can say our statistic is not likely to come from this boring distribution. Something interesting is happening. Right? And so that's the notion that we reject this boring distribution, this null distribution, or reject the null hypothesis, and then we accept, or we don't accept, but uh, we're forced to say that it's unlikely. Yeah. OK. Right. So this is just writing mathematically. It's the probability of random statistic from your null distribution would be greater than or equal to your observed. Um, it's not this. It is not the probability your hypothesis is correct. Right? If you want that, you need to use uh, Bayesian inference. Uh, and that's tricky, because then you have to make some assumptions about your prior. You guys covered Bayesian rule yesterday? OK, so in practice, people are doing it more, but it can be, it can be tricky. OK. All right, here's hypothesis test in five steps, using the trial metaphor. OK, um, so basically, uh, we can view hypothesis testing as analogous to a uh, criminal justice trial or something. So um, uh, basically what you do is you start when you're doing hypothesis testing by stating your null and alternative hypothesis. Um, null hypothesis is the data or saying nothing interesting is happening. Your alternative is what you are hoping to kind of see, that there is an effect there, right? Um, so this is equivalent to setting up the courtroom, right? We say this is what guilty looks like, this is what innocent looks like. Okay. Uh, the next thing you do is you gather evidence or you compute your statistic from your data. Um, and uh, what this is like is this is like gathering evidence in a crime scene. So you look at your sample and you say, how much blood is on this person? How many knives do they have? Uh, how many ski masks are they wearing? Um, and then uh, that gives you some sort of measure of uh, observed data. Uh, and then you create a distribution of what innocent people look like. So this is um, how many knives and how much blood does your average person have, or do most people have, right? There's going to be a distribution. Some people bleed more. Some people are chefs. Um, but uh, so, so you have your innocent distribution. Um, and then what you do, that's the null distribution. Then you um, look something like that. And then you see where does uh, the uh, statistic or the blood of the person you have relate to the blood that most people have, right? And so uh, that's your p-value. It's the probability that all these innocent people would have as much or more blood than the person you're uh, measuring. Okay. And then at the end, you can you can make a judgment, uh, assess whether the results are statistically significant. Any questions about that? Right, so how would you use, do a Bayesian analysis? Um, that's a good question. So in Bayesian analysis, you have a distribution over your parameters to start with. Right, so in a Bayesian distribution, you're actually trying to get a probability distribution over parameters, so over hypotheses. Um, and so you assume some baseline rate, and then you calculate essentially the p-value, and you multiply it by that baseline rate. And then you can calculate the probability of your data, and you normalize it by that. And that will give you the probability of your actual hypothesis. Um, and so I should have put up a, a Bayesian example. I can, I can look through. But um, you know, I'm trying to think of the ones that come to the top of my head. I teach a class in analyzing baseball data, or statistics through baseball. And so the one that comes to my head is like, if you measure someone's batting average, it's the number of hits they get. You know, most people are, at the end of a season are in the range between like 350, 35% of the time they get a hit. And you know. 
Um, and so if you just observe someone for a few games, you know, maybe they had really lucky and they got like uh, on base every single time. But if that was your point estimate, you'd be way off, right? So having some prior and knowing that people are in this typical range can help you uh, make better judgments if you have less data. Um, that's one example. There's a bunch of stuff you can do with Bayesian, like updating as new data comes in. Um, but it's, again, with Bayesian, you have a distribution over your parameters, whereas in frequentism, you assume there's a true parameter out there, and then you create like, uh, a null distribution from assumptions about that parameter being true. And it gives you long-run guarantees if you repeated your study many times. OK, any, any other questions? OK. So if you're doing hypothesis tests, there's a few different types. But uh, basically, there are these permutation tests, again, where you are doing, what time, what time is this? 2.45, OK. Um, so uh, with permutation tests, you uh, basically create your null distribution by randomly shuffling your data using computationally intensive methods. Um, so you essentially shuffle your conditions or your labels. And then, and then you compute. Um, the statistics on the shuffled data, and that gives you a null distribution, right? And you, re you repeat this many times to get null. Uh, in parametric tests, you assume your null distribution has a particular form based on mathematics, right? And so that gives you the null distribution without having to uh, do this computation of randomly shuffling your data many times to generate a null distribution, right? OK, and those are things like t-tests, you know, you can also do visual hypothesis tests. This is a little bit of a digression. Um, but um, it's kind of, a, I think, more of a new idea. Um, but basically, it, it's the idea is that um, if you're generating the null distribution using a permutation test, you're essentially shuffling your data. And, um, and what you could do is you could actually visualize those shuffles, the shuffle data, and compare it to your real data. And if you can, on a lineup, point out which is your real data and which is the shuffled data, um, then uh, there's probably your real data is not just generated by some sort of random process, right? Um, okay, so let's, um, I'm going to show you some plots. Let's see, uh, which is the actual data? Can we tell? Three, What's that? It's three, three. three, three? Yeah, so that's uh, 13 there. So people see the relationships there. So. Um, so what you do is, uh, yeah, so you, you can see it here. And these are all shuffled. So basically, um, for each data point, you've, you, you have you know, two coordinates, x and y, and they're lined up. right? And that gives you a linear relationship here. Um, but if you shuffle the order of the points, because under the null hypothesis, you're saying there's no relationship between them. right? Um, and so uh, these are all consistent with the null hypothesis, that there is no relationship between x and y. Uh, but you can clearly see in the real data, you can visualize it. So is not consistent. It doesn't look like an innocent person here. Right? And so that's the same thing that a permutation test is doing. These would all be points in your null distribution. And you could compute the correlation coefficient r. And then you'd look at your observed statistic and say, how many of these correlations are larger than the one in your real data? Right? And that's your p-value. OK? So that's. Uh, Explain hypothesis tests. Um, so just walking through a, a, a little bit more of a concrete example, kind of the, para, the archetyp, archetypal example of a hypothesis test is, is this pill effective? Whatever it is treating, I guess, Alzheimer's here. Um, I don't know. We're doing neuroscience. So um, if we want to test whether it's effective, um, what we can do is something called random assignment. This gets at causation. Uh, what you do here is you. Um, just randomly split your data into two parts, or your, your participants into two parts, right? Uh, one's a treatment group, one's a control group. Treatment get, group gets a drug. Con uh, control group gets placebo, right? We're all familiar with this. Um, and then you see if there's an, uh, an improvement in the treatment group, right? Participant pool, randomly assign them to two groups. Um, so the reason we do random assignment is because if we randomly split the people, most the treatment group should look like the control group if there's no effect, right? Does that make sense? On average, this can be pretty similar, right? So if you see a big difference in this group because they're randomly assigned and they should look like the same, then you can reject that um, the pill did nothing and say it's causal. 
Yep. Yes, exactly. So it will depend on the sample size, but um, well, I'll show you in a minute. Um, it, will still, it still has these long-term frequentness guarantees for the most part uh, if you're doing a permutation test um, because um, you know, if you had a small sample, well, let me show you the permutation test and then, then you can take a look at it. Um, so if you're doing a permutation test, um, well, first of all, if we're doing any kind of hypothesis test, step one is to state the null and alternative. So again, the null hypothesis is that the treatment and control are, have the same, let's say, mean level of whatever we're measuring, cognitive ability. Um, or you can write the difference in means is zero. And so, you know, when you're stating your hypotheses, um, you, again, we're using Greek symbols, right? Because we want to know something about the truth, the infinite process, right? Um, and then the alternative is that like the treatment helped the people, right? So that a higher cognitive ability, right? Or the difference is greater than zero. Okay, so that's step one. Step two, we're gonna calculate our observed statistic. Um, so our observed statistic um, is the average cognitive ability of our treatment group and the average minus the average of the control, right? And so our observed statistics is real data. So they got the X bars and it mirrors kind of the statistic measured or mentioned in the in step one, when you're stating your null alternative. Am I going too quick, too slow? Is this, okay. We only have a few minutes, so, okay. Okay, so what, what will we do next? What's that? Right, so, right, so step three, we have to generate the null distribution, and then step four, we see how extreme it is. So uh, to generate the, the null here, what we're going to do is, under the null hypothesis, we're saying there is no difference between the treatment and control. So we can view them as coming from the same sample, right? So it's perfectly fine for us to combine all our data together because everyone's equal. The pill had no effect, right? And so we combine everyone back together. And then what we do is we split them, uh, we shuffle them, and then we split them apart again, right? And so this is a proxy for your treatment group. It's just a bunch of random people, right? But that was under the null, these were just random people anyway, right? And then you have the random people in the shuffle, right? And then you compute your statistic on each of those uh, shuffles. Um, so X bar shuffle treatment, X bar shuffle control, get the difference, that's one point in your null, and repeat it many times. And so here, you know, if you had a small sample, what would happen is your null distribution would just tend to be pretty wide, right? but you could still have a really extreme statistic anyway, right, if, if it actually had an effect. Does that make sense? Okay. Okay, and so after you calculate one shuffled thing, you repeat this process 10,000 times, right, and that gives you, again, a bunch of what innocent people look like under the assumption of the null hypothesis, right? And then for step four, we take our observed statistic, and we say, what's the probability from these innocent people we would have gotten something as or more extreme, right? So this guy sort of looks like the rest of your statistics, but if we'd gotten a value way out there, we can say it's very unlikely to come from this distribution, right? And so again, the p-value is the probability that you get something as or more extreme from this null distribution. Yeah, so thanks for clarifying that. So the, uh, the probability you would get a, so the null distribution is a distribution of statistics, right, that are consistent with the null hypothesis. And so it's the probability from this distribution of boring statistics, you would have gotten one that was greater than the one you actually have, or as greater, greater. Does, does that make sense? So, right. Can I answer your question? What's that? So, okay, so, um, so right. So the way we did this um, was basically, so this was done in this step here. So you take your treatment and control, you combine them, you shuffle them up, and then you split it into two fake groups, right? 
And then with those fake groups, you calculate the, the mean of the shuffle treatment. It's not really treatment, but it's just a mean of how many people were in the treatment group and a mean of uh, a shuffle of the control group, right? Um, and so that's a difference of means there that's consistent with everyone being the same, right? And so that, that is uh, one point in this distribution. And then repeat that process again and again and again. And then this is a histogram of doing that 10,000 times, right? So this is all your statistics from doing that shuffling, right? And so these are a whole bunch of statistics that are consistent with the null hypothesis, that nothing interesting, there's no difference between the two groups, right? And then you say, well, it really doesn't look like, or it does look like my data that I actually have, in which case I can't say anything. My data could have been generated from this null distribution, this null process. But if it looks very different, we can just, we say, no, it doesn't look like that null distribution. Yep. Did I answer that? Are you? So, so That's right. That's exactly right. Yeah, the proportion more extreme. Yeah. Is, did you have a question too? No. Uh, I was going to ask whether, like, if you consider alternative hypothesis and different ways of doing the shuffling data, that it's probably more difficult than the null hypothesis because now you cannot really randomly divide them. But I'm wondering because if you plot the distribution of the null hypothesis, it may so turn out that it's pretty likely to get it from the null, but it's much more likely to get it from an alternative hypothesis. Yeah, so there you'd have to know something about what your alternative hypothesis is, right? So you'd have to formulate a, a distribution of right. what your data comes from. And that, again, that's going kind of into the Bayesian analysis, where you're comparing two different probability models. Right. And you can do things like either, I guess, without prior is a likelihood ratio. So the ratio, if you, if you could formulate this distribution here, um, the ratio of those two distributions, so it's you know, three times more likely to come from the null than it is to come from the alternative. Um, but, uh, or well, you can, yes, yeah. Exactly, but I'm curious, like, if you make a 20 step of that and then just calculate the bias you would get by only using the, like, frequentist analysis, like, how much, how much do you actually, like, are you playing on the safe side or are you playing on the non-conservative side? Have people done this kind of analysis? Um, so I'm not 100% sure. I mean, I right. think it depends so on the... Do this analysis and cut it off at 3 equals 0.05 or something. And yeah. And then if you compare it with a 20 example where you, you have a true value and you generate data from that true value, and then you, you do this two hypothesis comparison, I mentioned that in that case, you always select the hypothesis that's more likely to generate the sample you have. Like in, that, that's probably with complete knowledge is a better way of making decisions, right? And like comparing this decision-making process to that decision-making process and see like how, whether you are earning on the being conservative side or being too Right. Yeah. I mean, so nowadays people, if you're saying doing it through simulation, some people have tested a whole bunch of different methods with simulations. When you know what the real parameters are, you know exactly what the distribution is and you can see, you know, to the degree that the permutation test works. Um, and, you know, it's, I think it's fairly robust, um, more so than if you're assuming certain normal distributions and those are violated. Um, there's also a notion, I'll, I'll talk about it in, in a second, um, but the types of errors you can get and um, you know, what's more powerful. Um, so uh, sometimes the parametric ones can be slightly more powerful, but often not a lot. Um, so yeah, maybe I'll, I'll move on for one second because we've got about five more minutes and then uh, we, can, we can talk more as well. Um, okay, so there's the p-value, uh, which is that 6% um, of your null statistics are as great or greater than your observed statistic, right? Um, so, Question for you all, should you report the exact p-value or should you report something like it is less than 0 0.05? Exact, how many people think exact? How many people think less than 0 0.05? A couple people. So, you, so why, why would you say less than 0 0.05? Or putting you on the spot too much. Yeah, right. So there is equivalence between the two as well, which I don't have much time to talk about. But yeah, so, um, so it actually, it's not a completely, uh, uh, there's not exactly a right answer here necessarily. Yeah. Actually, I, I, I would not say that because if you do this 10,000 sampling and you do that process also 10,000 times, then you get a standard deviation and then you can use that to, to limit your precision. 
on their p-value to the, to the most significant digit, right? And wouldn't that just be a good way of determining how much precision you should report p at? Um, yes, it's, it's, it's quite a bit, it's, it's a little bit more tricky and complicated because, um, um, so if the null hypothesis is correct, is true, uh, the distribution of p-values is uniform. So um, you're just as likely to get any p-value, right? Um, so, uh, you know, but it means that only 5% of the time are you going to get one that's less than 0 0.05. Right. So um, anyway, let, again, I got just a few more minutes, so I'll just kind of run around pretty quick. Um, okay. So this kind of this kind of question here kind of comes down to um, a little bit, at least the way I'm going to frame it, as a debate between kind of the two founders of uh, uh, statistical testing. So one was um, so the cur the current thing, which is called null hypothesis significant testing, is actually a hybrid of two theories. Um, one is significant testing by Ronald Fisher, and one is hypothesis testing by uh, Jazari Naiman and Egon Pearson. Uh, this is Fisher, this is Naiman, and uh, they hated each other. Um, particularly, Fisher was uh, kind of mean to everyone. Um, and so um, the, the notion that uh, Naiman had in Pearson was that what you do is you set something called an alpha level before you start. Um, you set it, like, let's say, to 0 0.05. And if you get a p-value less than that, then you reject it. You reject the null hypothesis and say something interesting must have been happening. Uh, and if you get something uh, greater than 0 0.05, you fail to reject. And you can't say anything interesting is happening. And so if you do that procedure by setting it first and then seeing where you lie, then if you run many, many hypothesis tests, you will only make a mistake of rejecting when you shouldn't 5% of the time. Right? Um, so that's great, right? I can run any tests. I know what it tells you is that in the literature, only 5% of the results are wrong, right? You just don't know which ones they are, right? Whereas, you know, Fisher was like, that's terrible. No one cares about on average if the literature is right. You want to know if your experiment was right. Um, and so then he's like, you know, report the actual p value. But he came up, it's not kind of mathematically sound because it's really kind of a, weak proxy for Bayesian analysis. Um, and he called it, I think, like fiducial probability. And it's not actually even a probability. And so it's, if you want to be mathematically rigorous, you use this method. But it's not so good in practice. If you want to kind of get a little bit more insight, uh, report the p-value. Um, so I, I think you should report the p-value. I do that, because why throw away information? But um, it's less mathematically rigorous. OK. And you know, this goes into the two different type of errors. So by using Naiman's procedure of setting that alpha level, you control that only 5% of the literature is incorrect. Right? And ideally, you want to be as uh, use the statistical test that's most powerful. So you want to, if something, if the null hypothesis is wrong, you want to reject it most of the time to actually show that there is an experimental effect there. So you want to try to choose a test that's as powerful as possible. Um, OK, Ryan Gosling joke. Hey, girl, I made a type 1 error. I shouldn't have rejected you. Right. Okay. Um, oh, shoot. OK. I'll try to run this really quickly. So the problem is, using Naiman's procedure, we would have uh, only 5% of the literature would be wrong. But the problem is that people do many, many tests. So here's an example. Uh, jelly beans cause acne. Scientists investigate. Um, so we found a link between jelly beans. So we found no link between jelly beans and acne. Right, p is greater than 0.5. You couldn't reject, so we can't see if there's any relationship there. And then he says, well, that settles it. And, he, and then this girl's like, well, I see it's only for a certain color that causes, um, causes acne. So what they do is they test a bunch of colors. They test purple and brown and pink, blue. And then they keep testing tan, cyan, and then green, it's greater than, you know, less than 0.5, right? And so at the end of the day, they end up reporting that green jelly beans cause acne, right? So the problem is 5% of the tests you do, you're going to falsely reject. But if you do many, many tests, you're going to hit one of them by chance, right? So what I say is don't ever do this, right? Um, so you might have to do many tests, but you have to, it's good to be honest about this. Don't kind of fiddle with your data until you find something less than 0.05. Hopefully this is obvious to you all. 
Um, you know, it's this kind of basic ethics. Mm. Uh, yeah, if, yeah, you want to get at the truth, you're not getting at the truth just by showing random results, right? Um, it's also the file drawer effect. So, you know, people only publish the significant ones and, uh, you know, this has led to the replication crisis where people can't repeat experiments because it's not 5% of the literature that's wrong. It's, you know, 30 or 60 or 80, right? Because people are doing so many things and only publishing a small amount, right? Or there's different arguments, but um, maybe they're not searching for, they're searching for things they already know to be true. Um, you know, here's some data. This is percent of scientists that think there is a replication crisis, a reproducible crisis. 52% thinks it's significant, 38% slight, and only 7% say no. So I don't know if you have that feeling. Yep. Yeah. So you can, you can do different corrections. So, so that's, that's one way that people try to deal with uh, multiple hypothesis testing. So the Bonferroni is conservative. It's saying that if you run um, many tests, um, the probability that you'd get a false positive on any of them is less than 0 0.05. Um, yes, exactly. So it's a pretty simple correction. Um, so that's, that's one thing you can do. And you can also, there are ways to control the false discovery rate, um, which are a, a bit more involved. I'm not sure how well they work. But uh, so yeah, so you can try to do that and still uh, manage the uh, frequentist guarantees of that only 5% of any of your tests will be wrong. But then you're starting to lose power. So you, the ability, you need to collect a lot of data for each test if you ever wanted to reject the null at all. Or, Right. Um, so my solution is uh, you want to plan your experiment carefully and think about the tests you want to do beforehand. You might want to do some corrections that you probably should to, if you want to be rigorous. You know, I try to, so I'm going to tell you about decoding tomorrow. It's a very, very powerful method. So like my p-values are like zero. So I don't worry too much. Uh, you just see very, very big effects. So hopefully you're working in a regime where you see big effects or you can change the methods to try to get really, really clean and good data. Um, you know, maybe that's asking too much, but um, that, yeah, and the other thing I recommend is just to do reproducible research. So just be honest about all the tests you did and report them all. And there's a lot of tools now where you can create, uh, you know, documents that have both the code and the analysis so people can redo what you did. And so then if you had tested all those different jelly beans, someone would be like, well, this, like, look, you just did something ridiculous, right? Um, and there'd be actually a record of that. Right. And so these things are super nice. You, know, you, know, you have some code here, and then you get figures, and you can write in English what you're doing. And it's a, it's a good way to you know, have a record of all your analyses. You know, another, another way people try to do it is pre-registration, where they just outline everything they've done, what they're going to do, and they do exactly with the research plan. Um, and that is um, that's useful, but it's, um, you, you're really, in a certain sense, boxing yourself in, and there's kind of limits. I mean, the whole framework of hypothesis testing is very limited because you're kind of limiting yourself to yes and no questions. Um, so again, uh, tomorrow I'll be talking more about decoding where you can ask, I think, more interesting questions and, you know, um, it might be more powerful than this. You still, you still want to run hypothesis tests to make sure you're not fooling yourself, but there are other things you want to explore in your data too. Again, depending on what you're doing. Um, yeah. And then data science. Does anyone know what data science is? <laughs> What's that? Statistic? Yeah, so that's, that's one definition. Statistics done in uh, San Francisco or California or something. Uh, or MacBook. Any other definitions? So, yep. Right, so it's this combination of kind of computer science along with statistics to try to answer questions in a particular domain. So basically, another take that I have on it is that statisticians were very much uh, involved in mathematical methods. They did not have much training in computer programming. There was this big rise, you know, not all of them, some of them were doing compu computational methods, but the, the field kind of tended to emphasize math. And then people outside of the field discovered there's a lot of really useful ways you can do with computation that you can get 
uh, more profound insights into your questions. And so this kind of came up outside, and now uh, the field is uh, adjusting. Um, and so I thought a lot of people in statistics are pretty excited about uh, actually data science and the methods, and you know, there's a lot of enthusiasm around it. And so it's actually a very good chance a lot of you end up going into this field, because a lot of people in science do. I know someone like two years ago is now working for Showtime or whatever. And, um, so, uh, um, yeah, again, some of the methods I use, and I, probably a lot of methods you use might be considered more data science than classical statistics, and they can be very useful. Okay, I think, I think that's basically all I was going to say. I think we're over a little bit, but 